No reasonable person in the year 750 would have predicted that, of the three heirs of the Roman Empire, Western Europe would, by 1500, be well on its way to dominating the world. While Byzantium cut back, reorganized, and forged ahead, while Islam spread its language and rule over a territory that stretched nearly twice the length of the United States today, Western Europe remained an impoverished backwater. Fragmented politically and linguistically, its cities mere shells, its tools primitive, its infrastructure collapsing, Europe lacked identity and cohesion. That these and other strengths did indeed eventually develop over a long period of time is a tribute in part to the survival of some Roman traditions and institutions and in part to the inventive ways in which people adapted those institutions and made up new ones to meet their needs and desires. Taking in the whole of Western Europe around this time means dwelling long on its variety. Dominating the scene was Gaul, now taken over by the Franks, we may call it Francia, to its south were Spain and Italy. To the north, joined to rather than separated from the continent by the lick of water called the English Channel, the British Isles were home to a plethora of tiny kingdoms about three-quarters of which were native and the last quarter Germanic. There were clear differences between the Romanized South and the North. Travelers going from Anglo-Saxon England to Rome would have noticed them. There were many such travelers. Some, like the churchman Benedict Biscop, were voluntary pilgrims. Others were slaves on forced march. Making their way across England, voyagers such as these would pass fenced wooden farmsteads much like the ones at Widgester. These farmsteads typically had a relatively large house, outbuildings, and perhaps a sunken house, its floor below the level of the soil, its damp atmosphere suitable for weaving. Even royal complexes were made of wood and looked much like humble villages. Most such farmsteads were built in clusters of four to five, making up tiny hamlets. Peasants planted their fields with barley as well as oats, wheat, rye, beans, and flax. Two kinds of plows were used. One was heavy. It had a coulter and moldboard, often tipped with iron, to cut through and turn over heavy soils. The other was a light scratch plow, suitable for making narrow furrows and light soils. Because the first plow was hard to turn, the fields it produced tended to be long and rectangular in shape. The lighter plow was more agile. It was used to cut the soil in one direction and then at right angles to that, producing a square field. There were many animals on these farms cattle, sheep, horses, pigs, and dogs. In some cases, the peasants who worked the land and tended the animals were relatively independent, owing little to anyone outside their village. In other instances, regional lords commanded a share of the peasants' produce and, occasionally, labor services. But all was not pastoral or agricultural in England. Here and there, and especially toward the south, were commercial settlements. Crossing the channel, Travelers would enter northern Francia, also dotted with emporia but additionally boasting old Roman cities, now mainly religious centers. Paris, for example, was to a large extent an agglomeration of churches, Montmartre, Saint Laurent, Saint Martin de Champs. In the countryside around Paris, peasant families, each with its own plot, tended lands and vineyards that were largely owned by aristocrats. Moving eastward, our voyagers would pass through thick forests and land, more often used as pasture for animals than for cereal cultivation. Along the Mosul River, they would find villages with fields, meadows, woods, and watercourses, a few supplied with mills and churches. Some of the peasants in these villages would be tenants or slaves of a lord. Others would be independent farmers who owned all or part of the land that they cultivated. Near the Mediterranean, by contrast, the terrain still had an urban feel. Here the great hulks of Roman cities, with their stone amphitheaters, baths, and walls, dominated the landscape even though, as at Byzantium, their populations were much diminished. Peasants, settled in small hamlets scattered throughout the countryside, cultivated their own plots of land. In Italy many of them were real landowners. Aristocratic landlords were less important here than in Francia. The soil of this region was lighter than in the north, easily worked with scratch plows to produce the barley and rye and wheat that were the staples of the peasant diet. By 700, there was little left of the old long-distance Mediterranean commerce of the ancient Roman world. But, although this was an impoverished society, it was not without wealth or lively patterns of exchange. In the first place, money was still minted, 
but increasingly in silver rather than gold. The change of metal was due in part to a shortage of gold in Europe, but it was also a nod to the importance of small-scale commercial transactions. Brisk trade gave rise to new emporia and revivified older Roman cities along the coasts. In the third place, a gift economy was flourishing. Booty was seized, tribute demanded, harvests hoarded, and coins struck, all to be redistributed to friends, followers, dependents, and the church. Kings and other rich and powerful men and women amassed gold, silver, ornaments, and jewelry in their treasuries and grain in their storehouses to give out in ceremonies that marked their power and added to their prestige. Even the rents that peasants paid to their lords, mainly in kind, were often couched as gifts. If variations were plentiful in even so basic a matter as material and farming conditions, the differences were magnified by political and cultural conditions. We need now to take Europe kingdom by kingdom. Francia comes first because it was the major player, a real political entity that dominated what is today France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and much of Germany. In the 7th century, it was divided into three related kingdoms, each of which included parts of a fourth, southern region, Aquitaine. By 700, however, the political distinctions between them were melting, and Francia was becoming one kingdom. The line of Clovis ruled these kingdoms. The dynasty owed its longevity to biological good fortune and excellent political sense. It allied itself with the major lay aristocrats and ecclesiastical authorities of Gaul. To that alliance, the kings brought their own sources of power. A skeletal Roman administrative apparatus, family properties, appropriated lands once belonging to the Roman state, and the profits and prestige of leadership in war. The royal court was the focus of political life. Here gathered talented young men, clerics. The most important courtiers had official positions. There was, for example, the referendary and the cupbearer. Highest of all was the mayor of the palace, who controlled access to the king and brokered deals with aristocratic factions. Queens were an important part of the court as well. One of them, Baldhild, had once been one of the unwilling travelers from England. Purchased there as a slave by the mayor of the palace of Neustria, she parleyed her beauty into marriage with the king himself. Baldhild's biographer praised her for ministering to all the men at court. When her husband, King Clovis II, died in 657, Baldhild served as regent for her minor sons, acting, in effect, as king during this time. Meanwhile, she gave generously to churches and monasteries. By the end of her life, Baldhild was counted a saint. Just as a king's power radiated outward from his court, so too did aristocrats command their own lordly centers. Like kings, they had many homes at one time, scattered throughout Francia, tending to their estates, honing their skills in the hunt. Aristocratic men regularly led armed retinues to war. They proved their worth in the regular taking of booty and rewarded their faithful followers afterwards at generous banquets. And they bedded down. The bed was the focus of marriage, the key to the survival of aristocratic families and the transmission of their property and power. Though churchmen had many ideas about the value of marriage, they had nothing to do with the ceremony. No one married in a church. Rather, marriage was a family affair, and a very expensive one. There was more than one form of marriage. In the most formal, the husband-to-be gave his future bride a handsome dowry of clothes, bedding, livestock, and land. Then, after the marriage was consummated, he gave his wife a morning gift of furniture and perhaps the keys to the house. Very rich men often had, in addition to their wife, one or more concubines at the same time. These enjoyed a less formal type of marriage, receiving a morning gift but no dowry. The wife's role was above all to maintain the family. A woman passed from one family to the next by parental fiat. When they married, women left the legal protection of their father for that of their husband. Did women have any freedom of action? Yes. For one thing, they had considerable control over their dowries. Some participated in family land transactions, sales, donations, exchanges, and the like. Upon the death of their husbands, widows received a portion of the household property. Although inheritances generally went from fathers to sons, many fathers left bequests to their daughters, who could then dispose of their property more or less as they liked. In 632, for example, the nun Burgundafra, who had never married, drew up a will giving to her monastery the land, 
slaves, vineyards, pastures, and forests that she had received from her two brothers and her father. In the same will, she gave other property near Paris to her brothers and sister. Bergen d'Offre's generous piety was extraordinary only in degree. The world of kings, queens, and aristocrats intersected with that of the church. The arrival on the continent of the fierce Irish monastic reformer St. Columbanus marked a new level of association between the two. Columbanus's brand of monasticism, which stressed exile, devotion, and discipline, made a powerful impact on Merovingian aristocrats. They flocked to the monasteries that he established in both Francia and Italy, and they founded new ones on their own lands in the countryside. In Francia alone, there was an explosion of monasteries. Between the years 600 and 700, an astonishing 320 new houses were established, most of them outside of the cities. Some of the new monks and nuns were grown men and women. Others were young children, given to a monastery by their parents. This latter practice, called ablation, was well accepted and even considered essential for the spiritual well-being of both children and their families. Irish monasticism introduced aristocrats on the continent to a deepened religious devotion. Those who did not actively join or patronize a monastery still read, or listened to others read, books preaching penance, and they chanted the psalms. Sometimes they claimed one of their own as a saint and martyr. Ludigar, Bishop of Auten, was, according to his biographer, a new martyr in Christian times. Just as he was nobly born according to earthly descent, so, he stood out prominently ahead of others, no matter what the office, to which he was promoted. The Merovingian laity, especially the aristocratic laity, developed a culture of domestic piety at about the same time as the Byzantines did. Deepened piety did not, in this case, lead to the persecution of others. In particular, where Jews were settled in Western Europe, they remained integrated into every aspect of secular life. They used Hebrew in worship, but otherwise they spoke the same languages as Christians and used Latin in their legal documents. Their children were often given the same names as Christians, they dressed as everyone else dressed, and they engaged in the same occupations. Many Jews planted and tended vineyards, in part because of the importance of wine and synagogue services, in part because the surplus could easily be sold. Some were rich landowners, with slaves and dependent peasants working for them. Others were independent peasants of modest means. While some Jews lived in cities most, like their Christian neighbors, lived on the land. Celtic groups from the north and west had often attacked Roman Britain. When the last of the Roman garrisons left Britain 410, new immigrants arrived piecemeal. They came as families, in small boats made of animal skins, to settle and farm along Britain's east coast. Irish immigrants gradually settled in the west. Elsewhere, Celtic kingdoms survived. Where the Germanic tribes settled, their tastes, expectations, styles, and religious practices affected the indigenous British population, and vice versa. In the 8th century, the monk historian Bede portrayed this amalgamated culture as utterly pagan. Anglo-Saxon England was, in his words, a barbarous, fierce, and unbelieving nation. But the story that archaeology tells is more nuanced. Holy sites of the saints remain magnets for pilgrimage, burial, and settlement. Most, perhaps all, of the British Isles remained Christian. Wales was already Christian when, in the course of the 5th century, missionaries converted Ireland and Scotland. However, in contrast to Bede's vision of a highly organized church led by the Pope, post-Roman Britain's Christianity was decentralized and local. The same was true in the Celtic kingdoms which supported relatively non-hierarchical church organizations. Rural monasteries often served as the seats of bishoprics as well as centers of population and settlement. Abbots and abbesses, often members of powerful families, enjoyed considerable power and prestige.